County students, my name is Chantal Antonis and I teach 7th grade English at Cedar Bluff Middle School. Now today's lesson is based on the task 4 assignment for 7th grade ELA. If you don't have this assignment yet, you'll want to go to the KCS website at knoxschools.org and once you get there, you'll go to where it says see all resources here at the bottom and that's where you'll be able to access the task. Now if you haven't completed this task, then you'll want to go ahead and pause the video complete the task, and then come back to the video so that we can go over it together, okay? If you have completed task four, then you're in the right place, and let's get started. For all of the tasks you've done, you've been gearing up, learning important skills for argumentative writing. You've learned about making claims, you've learned about supporting those claims with evidence, and you've also learned about rhetorical devices. All of those things are gonna help you out today with this lesson. So. The first thing to look at were the learning targets. Analyze the logic and the development of different points of view in the consideration of alternatives. So you're looking to make sure that the different points of view are logical and you analyze the logic each side uses. Also, you're looking at creating a claim to argue a position in a debate using an appropriate mode of delivery. This is helpful as well because you're reading two different essays and you get to see how they did it before doing it on your own. Before you ever read anything, it's important to have a purpose for reading. So here, right underneath where it says setting a purpose for reading, that's an awesome place for you to decide, okay, what am I looking for while I read? So let's take a look. The first purpose is to take notes in the My Notes section, so that's right here above me, on the author's feelings about social media. So anytime you see the author stating their opinion or hinting at what their opinion is regarding social media, you'll wanna make a note there. Also, if you'd like, just while you're reading to kinda of keep the flow of the reading going, you could just highlight or underline. Same difference, and maybe you wanna write the notes at the very end to refresh your memory, to remind you what you read. The second task we are doing while we read is circling unknown words and phrases. Now, it's not enough just to circle those words and say, oh, well, I'll never know. It's important to determine the meaning of those words. So use context clues, word parts, or a dictionary. You have the internet at your disposal. You can definitely look those words up and maybe make a note of them above where you've circled. Before we read, we need to do one more thing. Let's learn about the author. So hopefully you already read this. Why do you need to know about the author before you read? It's important to know who wrote it and maybe even start to understand why they wrote it, what their motivation was. It's also important to determine what their credibility is of an author. We're learning about their opinions, and if we want to believe their opinion, then we need to see, okay, is this a credible source? Let's take a look at Marcelo Gleiser, or Gleiser. He's a professor of physics and astronomy. His research covers both the very big, the universe as a whole, and the very small, particle physics, or the smallest material constituents in the universe. He's also very interested in the origin of life on Earth and the possibility of life elsewhere in the universe. So the title is, Should We Live Life or Capture It? Before I even start reading, I'm going to consider the title. You should always consider the title, especially in informational writing. It usually hints at what the main idea or the main claim of the essay is going to be about or the text. All right, paragraph one. Everyone is or wants to be the star of their own life, and the rage is on to capture every moment deemed meaningful. There is a side of it that makes sense. We all matter, our lives matter, and we want them to be seen, shared, and appreciated. But there's another side that leads to disengagement with the moment. So I'm actually going to stop there. I would underline, make a note of, or highlight this line right here. He's saying, it's important to capture moments, and I understand why we do that but then there's this other side. He's purposely bringing up the idea that we could be disengaged while doing that. Um, circle this words if you didn't know already, and then consider the parts, dis and then engagement. So we, you might know what engagement means, being engaged, but then disengagement, not being focused. All right, let's keep going. Are people forgetting to be present in the moment, scattering their focus by looking at life through a screen? Should you be living your life or living it for others to see it? So he's asking us important rhetorical questions for us to consider about ourselves. Paragraph three. It is telling, however, that this all started before the cell phone revolution. Something happened between the private journal we kept locked in our drawer 
in the portable video camera. For example, in June 2001, I led a group on a cruise to see a total solar eclipse in Africa. On board were a crowd of eclipse groupies, people who go around the world chasing eclipses. Once you, once you see one, you can understand why. A total solar eclipse is a deeply moving experience that awakens a primal connection with nature, linking us to something totally, something bigger and truly awesome about the world. It needs total commitment and focus of all senses. Yet, as totality approached, the ship's deck was a sea of cameras and tripods as dozens of people prepared to photograph and videotape the four minute long event. Wow. Okay. He goes into a lot of detail about this story where he was on a cruise ship with multiple groups of people looking at solar eclipses. I think he starts hinting at his opinion, if not completely telling us his opinion about recording these experiences. He describes a total solar eclipse right here as a deeply moving experience that awakens a primal connection with nature. Okay, so linking us to something bigger. Then he says it needs total commitment and focus of all senses. So remember, earlier in this essay, he mentions how recording something or taking a video of it might result in us being disengaged or not as focused as we could be. Now we know that he thinks that that's negative because he's saying this experience with the total eclipse needs total commitment and focus of all senses. So I would make a note of this line. Now the following line gives us a word we might want to circle Maybe you already knew it, that's awesome. But it says, yet as totality approached, the ship's deck was a sea of cameras and tripods. So let's think about what the word totality might mean. It's saying as totality approached, so we haven't quite reached totality, again, whatever that might mean. So that means it's something that you get to after a while. And if we're talking about eclipse, we know that that's like an action of the moon and the sun. So let's look, and sometimes articles, essays, different document or texts help us with this. It actually gives us the definition here at the bottom. Sometimes that could be in the footnote. If you've noticed in your textbooks, it might have a key. Um, it's really important to go ahead and look for that. But it's also important to use context clues because we won't always have those keys. Paragraph four, instead of fully engaging with this most spectacular natural phenomenon, people chose to look at it from behind their cameras. I was shocked. There were professional photographers on board and they were going to sell slash give pictures away. But people wanted to take their pictures and videos anyway, even if they weren't going to be half as good. I went to two other eclipses and it's always the same thing. No full personal engagement. The gadget is the eye through which they choose to see reality. All right, so we're getting more and more of our author's opinion here. Notice the word choices that he uses. He says, instead of fully engaging, and then he's saying it's the most spectacular natural phenomenon. People chose to look from it behind their cameras. And he was shocked about this. So those are more lines that I would take a note of. He even makes a point of mentioning that there were going to be professional photographers. So it's not as if they weren't going to get their pictures. It's just as that they wanted to see it through a lens instead. He also goes on to prove, you know, this didn't just happen one time. So you can't tell me this isn't true. He tells us that he went to two other eclipses and the same thing happened. Paragraph five, what cell phones plus social media have done is to make the archiving and the sharing of images amazingly easy and efficient. The reach is much wider and the gratification, how many likes a photo or video gets, is quantitative. Lives become a shared social event. Now there's a side of this that is fine, of course. We celebrate meaningful moments and want to share with those we care about. The problem starts when we stop fully participating in the moment because we have this urge to record it. Without trying to sound too nostalgic, but sounding, there is nothing like eye-to-eye -eye contact or the sharing of an experience through the real act of engaging in a conversation with friends and family. The gadgets are awesome, of course, but they should not define the way we live, only complement it. All right, this is where he makes his biggest point of what his opinion is. This is where he concludes his opinion. It, he says the problem starts. That's an important word choice there. He said this is a problem. The problem starts when we start fully when we stop, excuse me, fully participating in the moment because we want to record it instead. And then he said there's nothing like eye-to-eye -eye contact. 
Now let's go to the returning text questions now. What is the author's main claim in the text? So what is the main idea? What's the main point that he was trying to get across throughout his essay? So I put too many people have forgotten how to live in the moment. And then I found evidence for this. One of the quotes says, our lives have become a shared social event. So throughout the essay, he's making it clear that he believes people only have the need to record their experiences and they've forgotten now how to just live in the moment, just to enjoy it. Second question, what evidence does the author use to support his argument? So he uses the example of people traveling around the world to see a total eclipse. He uses an anecdote. But they were so concerned with seeing it through a camera and recording the moment that they neglected to fully participate in the experience. The third question, oh look, we already talked about this a little bit. What might totality mean in the second paragraph? So use context clues to infer the meaning. So you wanna go back to the text and look at where totality is used and it helps you out because it says, it's in the second paragraph, but we worked it out together a little bit and we saw there was a key, but it's also, like I said, important to try to figure it out before you go straight to the dictionary because there might be instances where you don't have one. So the author talks about the eclipse as moving and awesome, and then says a to as totality approach. So that means signifying something everyone was waiting for. Totality must mean the moment during a solar eclipse when the sun is completely covered by the moon. Last question. What rhetorical device does the author use in the text? What is the effect of this question on the reader? The author poses the question, should you be living your life or living for others to see it? Okay, so the question is directly posed to us, the readers, because then it focuses us to consider an answer. And, and then in the process, we're evaluating what our own ideas about technology are. So now we're gonna read the second essay. So like I said, we're comparing two different opinions on the same issue. And just like last time, we need to see the setting of purpose for reading. It says, as you read, underline the author's claims or opinions, put a star next to any sources used to support the claim. And then just like last time, we are circling unknown words and phrases. So our author is Megan Garber. She is a staff writer at The Atlantic, where she writes about technology and culture. She's a founding editor for the innovation section of Columbia Journalism Review's website. In recognition of excellence in media reporting, Garber earned the Mirror Award. She attended Columbia, where she earned a master's degree in journalism. All right, so she writes for The Atlantic, and she writes about technology and culture. So she definitely probably has experience with talking about social media. So let's check out what she says in her essay titled The Joy of Instagram. Is there any genre of image that better captures the current technological moment than the sea of screens at a concert or a rally or a show thrust upward to document a shared experience? The layering of lights reflecting an event in the moment and capturing it for later neatly conveys the frenetic beauty of life as it's lived at the dawn of the internet age. In the anxieties too, because you know, does documenting something cheapen it? Does that sea of screens take something meaningful away from the stage they are aimed at? Does our impulse to snap and insta and tweet and otherwise capture the events of our lives denude those events and by extension, those lives? According to a new paper, no. Kristen Deal, an associate professor of marketing at the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business and a team of colleagues wanted to put those ideas to the test. So pause. This is where I would take a pen or a pencil or whatever, and I would star right here. Here is a source. Kristen Deal, who's a professor of marketing at the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business. That is a source. All right, let's see what our source has to share with us. Capturing experiences through photos the team found, far from compromising people's enjoyment, of those experiences actually seem to amplify the enjoyment. A photographic mindset doesn't seem to prevent people from living in the moment, as the old accusation goes. It might actually help them to do that living. Okay, so our source tells us that taking pictures doesn't compromise people's enjoyment, instead it amplifies the enjoyment. Okay, so a lot of people say it doesn't keep us from living in the moment, um, and instead it might actually help them live more. So that is definitely an opinion that she is providing here. Otherwise, she would not want this evidence. So I would underline these lines right here. 
Number three, paragraph three. It's not the act of photo taking itself to be clear that leads to the enjoyment. It's the kind of mental curation that is required when you're thinking about what is worth documenting in the first place. Instagram makes us the editors of the text of our own lives. It demands choices about what is significant and therefore worth saving and savoring and remembering. And what is less so, Deal, here we go again, star her name, and her colleagues, so star them too, they deserve it, tested the idea on a sightseeing bus with nearly 200 participants and found that the people who photographed the sites in question enjoyed the experience much more than those who simply sat and watched and absorbed. They tested it in museums too. People reported enjoying exhibits more when they photographed them. And yep, the findings held when it came to that most cliched of activities, the Instagramming of food. The study participants who were encouraged to take photos while they ate lunch ended up being more immersed in the dining experience than the people who weren't. So let's pause here. We got a lot of information, again, from the source of Kristen Deal and her colleagues. So we've put a star next to Deal and her colleagues because that's the source. And then look at the evidence they gave. Paragraph four, it may come down to the difference between dining and merely eating, the notion that even something as simple as lunch can be, if you allow it to, an experience. Something worth savoring in the present, sure, but also worth preserving for the future. I would definitely underline this last line because what our author is telling us is even though for some people it might seem like you're just eating lunch, but for others it becomes an experience and not only are you taking a picture in the moment, but you're actually keeping it, saving it, preserving it for a later date. So we found some great sources. We found some great evidence. So now we're going to look at the returning to the text question. So the first question is similar to the last text we read. What is the author's main claim? Identify text that helps you answer the question. So my answer is using social media to share photos and events does not make us enjoy those moments any less. The author claims that an experience is, quote, something worth savoring in the present, sure, but also worth preserving for the future. Question two, what does denude mean in the first paragraph? So you wanna go back to that first paragraph Find the word denude. Let's do that together right now. It says, does our impulse to snap and insta and tweet and otherwise capture the events of our lives denude those events and by extension, those lives? So let's think together on what that word can mean by using context clues. This means to take away, to diminish, to lessen. So if you think of the fact that the word cheapen is also in the first paragraph, you could contrast that between dining and eating in the final paragraph. What is the purpose of including the rhetorical questions in the first paragraph? Okay, so again, let's go back to the first paragraph together. She asks us a lot of questions because I commented on that. So let's pick a few. Does documenting something cheapen it? Question. Does the sea of screens take something meaningful away from the stage they are aimed at? Does our impulse to snap and insta and tweet and otherwise capture the events of our lives denude, which now we know means take away, those events, and by extension, our lives. So she is basically hinting at all of the different arguments people could be making against her point. That's something that we call the counterclaim. First paragraph, she brings up all of the things that people might say if they were to argue with her claim. So why do you think she did that? What do you think the purpose of doing that is? Well, I think it's because when you're reading the article, she might know that people are gonna start thinking that in their head as they read, and instead, She's bringing it up immediately and then trying to prove that that's not true. Last question, how did the author add credibility to, their, to her argument? So you'll want to consider how was her essay different from the first essay? What did she put in hers that the first essay maybe lacked? She supports her argument by citing research results from a paper written by professors at the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business. So that definitely adds to her credibility or her ethos, right? We're looking at the section that says working from the text. It says reread and mark the text for logical reasoning and devices. Annotate by analyzing or commenting on the effect of the reasoning and devices. So this is a kind of reading focus. You can read this a second time or really skim through 
and you're going to look for logical reasoning and devices. So remember, you learned some rhetorical devices in the last couple lessons. So you're going to want to annotate and look for those. What did each author do to try to prove their point, to support their claim? And then we're going to complete this graphic organizer. Here is our graphic organizer comparing the different points of view. So on the left, we've got evidence and reasons for documenting life through social media, like we talked about, and then deciding whether or not the argument's effective, and then reasons and evidence against documenting life through social media, and again, whether or not this argument is effective. This first section on the left deals with our second article, the joys, of in the joys of Instagram. So I found some pieces of evidence and reasons and then went through how I decided if the argument was effective or not. So you wanna see if you came up with some similar pieces of evidence. As you can tell, I didn't completely fill in the chart. I just wanted to give you an idea. Um, there's definitely more evidence to be found. So one of the main reasons that um, our author in the second article gives is that social media enhances people's experiences. So there's a quote in paragraph two that states, capturing experiences through photos amplifies the enjoyment. And this is an effective argument because it's done by someone who has knowledge on the topic. Another piece of evidence I found that goes along with the idea that social media enhances people's experiences, Kristen Deal and her colleagues tested the idea that social media enhances people's experiences on a sightseeing bus with nearly 200 participants and found that the people who photographed the sites in question enjoyed the experience more than people who sat and watched paragraph three. I came back here to paragraph three to show you that this is just one of many quotes that can be used to support her claim. So I said the same kind of explanation for why the argument is effective because again, it's done by researchers and it's a large pool of people. Notice that this has nearly 200 participants and you could continue adding to that and continue testing that. Let's look for the reasons and evidence against documenting life through social media. So that's that first article we looked at together. The first reason that author gave for why social media should not always be the goal, but you should live life and, and be in the moment, is people should live in the moment rather than through a screen. So he says multiple times, it gives examples for why this is true. The quote I found was in paragraph four, instead of fully engaging with the most spectacular natural phenomenon, oh, I spelled that wrong, people chose to look at it through their cameras. So you wanna go back to his article, should we live life or capture it? I said it's in paragraph where he asks us these two questions. That's also an important piece of evidence you could find. And then in paragraph three is when he shares his anecdote or his story about his experience. In paragraph four, instead of fully engaging with this most spectacular natural phenomenon, people chose to look at it from behind their cameras. He was shocked. Okay. So again, we're referencing the article, should we live life or capture it? Now, whenever I was determining whether or not this argument was effective, I kind of started comparing it to the previous article, The Joys of Instagram, because even though our author is pretty credible as he's a professor um, of astronomy and physics, it's not necessarily that he is well versed in social media or, or technology. Okay, so that's something to consider. So I said the argument is somewhat effective because it could appeal to people's emotions, thinking to themselves, am I fully engaged in life or am I just documenting things? That's a way that it could be effective. And a quote to support that is, the problem starts when we stop fully participating in the moment because we have this urge to record it, paragraph six. So his opinion is different from the Joy of Instagram article or essay in that he's saying, can we really be in the moment if the first instinct we have is to pull out our cell phones and record it? And again, I said that the argument is somewhat effective because it, it just depends on the person. It could again appeal to emotions by referencing this experience. All right, now we're going to look at acknowledging counterclaims. This is a very important part of argumentative writing. Part of argue, arguing effectively is considering alternatives and acknowledging opposing claims, also known as counterclaims, the other side of the issue. Recognizing counterclaims adds to a reader's credibility ethos, 
because it shows that he or she is knowledgeable about the issue. To acknowledge a counterclaim, a writer or speaker recognizes an opposing viewpoint and then argues against it, perhaps by finding weaknesses within the opposing reasons and evidence and thereby supporting his or her argument. In other words, it is the yes, but part of the argument. Yes, recognizing the counterclaim, but is the writer's response to it. You might want to read that over one more time. It's important to acknowledge counterclaims because that's what your reader or listener is probably already thinking in their head. If you can go ahead and acknowledge like, yes, I understand that this is an, an opposing opinion, however, and then prove them wrong, that makes you as a writer or reader or speaker seem more credible, okay? Let's look at this example. So here's the issue. A teenager wants parental permission to go to a concert. Here's the teenager's claim. I should be allowed to go to a concert without an adult. Here are some counterclaims they might consider and the reason behind it or the rebuttal. Of course you are worried about me going without you. However, I have a cell phone with me and we can check in throughout the concert. Another counterclaim. Certainly I can see why you might be concerned because you don't know all my friends. But... I'll be glad to ask your, their parents to call and reassure you. Last counterclaim. Admitting, admittedly, it is a good point that I do have homework. On the other hand, the concert is only a few hours long and I plan to get most of my homework completed before I go. So notice, before the teenager even allowed for these points to be brought up, they thought of most counterclaims and came up with reasons why they shouldn't matter anymore why why it doesn't it should not be a concern okay then it asks us to reflect how well did each author deliver his or her argument so this is talking about the two essays we read about how clear was each writer's claim did you fully understand what they were claiming and did each speaker incorporate adequate evidence or logos to address the counterclaim were there questions in there that they asked to bring up potential counterclaims and do you feel like they address them well, as in proving them wrong? Okay? You guys have been doing an amazing job. Here is the end of our lesson. So this is an argumentative writing prompt. It asks you to consider the following questions, okay, for this prompt. Should we live life or capture it? Write a well-constructed response and defend your claim. So you are creating a claim whether or not people should live life, so not having to document every moment, or capture it. Yes, it is good, it is important to capture every life's moment. Okay, so you're writing a well-constructed response to defend whichever claim you choose. You're citing evidence from both essays, so the joy of Instagram, and then the essay, should we live life or capture it? Okay, here are some points that you want to pay attention to as you are writing this constructed response. What's awesome is you already should have a lot of quotes, a lot of evidence, logos, to use when defending your claim if you fully filled in that graphic organizer. Okay, let's look what you should consider while writing. So clearly describe and acknowledge the counterclaim you do want to bring up the opposition's point, okay? The people that might argue with you. You wanna use transitions and complex sentences with phrases and clauses to make your point. So complex sentences are important to know. Notice that here's a grammar and usage little passage here to help you understand what that complex sentence means, okay? Beefs up our writing. Use correct spelling, grammar, and punctuation as always. Check to make sure that you have used parallel structure in lists of, or series of words, infinitives, prepositional phrases, or clauses. And finally, establish and maintain a formal style. This is not when we're saying, I totally believe, or I really think. This is when you state, people should live their life rather than capture it. Notice that that still states your opinion without being informal, without using I, without having to say I believe or I think. All right, well, thank you so much for watching this task four video. If you have questions, feel free to reach out, email your English teachers, watch the video again, pause, go back, 
reread the articles, and I hope you are all doing well.